thought between me pressing the button to go live, I would have a magic three seconds to shoot down the edge of the garden to go and pick something, but it seems like I haven't. So hello and good morning. It is 10.15. Um, usually I come on my Tuesday YouTube live at 8.15, but I had a long standing appointment at the hairdresser this morning. So I put a poll over on my community tab on YouTube and over in my Facebook group. And the consensus was that rather than get up at 7.15 in the morning, you would rather have the YouTube live a little bit later. So here we are, 10.15 on Tuesday, the 30th of August, struggling to remember the date. And the weather has turned slightly. Woke up this morning, absolutely torrential rain. Not very good, I'm going to go to the hairdresser. So I had to take my umbrella with me. But it looks like it's going to hold off. There's definitely rain clouds in the air and there's definitely a warmth to the air. I'm just fingers crossed that I'm not actually going to get wet. Otherwise, that's going to be a whole different show. So if you are watching, please leave me a comment just to check in, make sure you can hear me and you can see me okay. And um, let me know where in the world you're watching. And good morning, Linda, I can see you. That is fabulous. So I'm going to take my scissors, Linda, and I'm going to head up to the garden. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because, good morning, Joan, hello there, Joan. Um, my husband's been out in the garden doing his morning routine of, um, I'm just coming in for the comments and I miss them, um, doing the chickens and sorting things out. So um, I hope I've timed this right, that he'll be out on his dog walk so we won't get any, you know, <laughs> people walking in the background or dogs yapping. So, and, and the reason I'm cutting this piece of um, foliage, it's, it's a flower actually, pink flower, um, Japanese anemone is because, as you know, we don't have many flowers in our garden. So when I do cut, my husband likes me to cut so he can't tell where I've been. So I was having a look around the garden this morning, hence I was trying to run up to the other end of the garden before the film went live, because I have spotted our Japanese anemone in flower. And I think they're going to look really great for the little vase arrangement that I'm going to be making today. I'm thinking, everything quite small today so as i walk up to the end of the garden and step into the flower bed with my trusty scissors let's see whether i can cut this flower stem so although i'm making oh <laughs> there's a deep in, in shot of breath there i've been caught in the act but there's plenty left on the rest of the bush so this is the most perfect flower. I've cut it really, really long. I'm just looking off camera, I've been caught out. <laughs> and I think there's some deep breathing going on. But I've cut it really long so that you can't see where I have cut it from. But what I'm going to use it for is um, the individual buds. So <laughs> the back door has just been locked. So I'm obviously in trouble here. A lovely collection of flowers because it's got the full bloom. It's got the buds that are about to um, open up and, and also it's got the very tight seed head. And what I'm actually going to be doing, <laughs> I was distracted, Jane. Um, I was caught in the act. I, I truly thought the dog walk <laughs> was imminent. So it's me right there. But what I'm going to do when I put it in my vase, I'm going to cut it down really short, but I've cut it really, really long in order that I'm not left with a, um, you know, a short, very obvious stem where I've cut the flower. So that's why I leant over and got that. And basing that on the scale of what I'm going to cut from the rest of the garden, I'm going to go quite small. So this is what I'm going to be using today. So this is quite a small, windows <laughs> you're right linda i think i am in trouble <laughs> but um he's walked away now so, <laughs> so he's no longer making rude actions and mouthing things at me i've got this little vase here it says on the back it's from wedgwood actually and it's gift barlaston is that the name of the town where it's made um so this tiny little dish and that 
flour is so lightweight, it's fallen out of the container. And then I've got this little bit of chicken wire. So this chicken wire is as vintage, I reckon, as the pot. I don't think it actually came in this pot, but definitely it came from one of the um, pots I've thrifted over time. So that is what I'm going to be arranging in today. And because it's all really small scale, I don't want to pick big flowers in my from the garden so it's not a matter of picking what I've got you know just cut 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 trying to be a little bit more mindful of what I'm cutting because I only need to have small things otherwise it's going to overpower the arrangement so I wasn't going to hold my chicken wire in place I thought it would just lie nicely but I thought you know what's going to happen it's all going to tumble out of the vase so I've got some pot tape here and this is actually the clear pot tape that you you can buy and when I um, when the video goes to be published after filming live I will add a link to this pot tape in the description if you are interested in sourcing your own so I've got a piece of tape you can't see what I'm doing it's clear but I have just taped it in in order that when I hold it upside down or when I put my flowers in the chicken wire isn't going to, um, to to fall out and also I've cut a really long piece of tape and the only reason I've done that it comes right down here is because I'm filming and I thought if I filmed a conventional amount of tape um, oh you're watching from Singapore oh fantastic um, that normally I would probably just put my my um, tape down to about here so it didn't show up but I'm going belt and braces because um, I don't want it to fall out live on air. We have had enough disruptions to the broadcast already. So, um, yes, Joan, I glimpsed your comment. Is everything going phone-free these days? Very much so, I would say. And we'll start to see it as a small change. And I think it's going to tumble and tumble and tumble and snowball. And in several years' time, we'll look back on ourselves and we'll think... Why do we ever use flower foam? It's a single-use plastic. It is harmful to the environment. But all change takes a while. Do you remember how long um, you know, it took before seatbelts became the norm or no smoking in pubs and restaurants and offices became the norm? All these things take time. So there has been a growing movement of florists um, going foam-free. And you can you know, follow the hashtag foam free flowers, the proponents of it under the hashtag floristry is changing, um, flowers on the farm, all those kinds of activities. And even um, there's a hashtag for church flowers as well. I can't quite remember what that is, something like sustainable church flowers. I'm not quite sure what it is, but certainly it is well and truly being embraced. But like all things, like all change, it, it's difficult to make the change. But it's about making those small steps. You know, I go running. I couldn't immediately run 5K on the day I went to my class. I could barely run five metres. But it's that small change, it's that commitment to turn up to my running class each week. And, you know, I did five metres the first night and you know three weeks later I was running 500 metres and then 10 weeks later I was running my 5k so it's about starting out on your journey for going foam free and I think the more that you embrace that journey the more you realise that yes flower foam is really easy to use it's great from a design point of view you can get your flowers to hang upside down sideways and create all these really huge, um, you know, fantastically creative arrangements. But that's not to say you can't do the same thing with foam-free flowers. You just need to have a little think and perhaps tap into how our mothers and grandmothers and aunts used to arrange back in the day, as they say. You know, flower foam became really popular in, you know, started to become popular in the 60s, 70s. So how did we arrange flowers in the early 60s or the 50s or the 40s? And it's going back to those old principles and then, um, you know, putting our modern day twist on it. And it's really good for the old grey matter. You're thinking, how can I do this? If I don't use flower foam, how can I adapt my techniques? And as we're talking about techniques, a little bit of an advert, my next series of Zoom flower classes start on Tuesday, the 27th of September, 12 noon. So that will still be British summer time. It'll always be my local time of 12 noon, which means the classes are on Zoom. You can come during your lunch break if you're still working from home. The um, demonstration of a bit of class 
lasts about 40 minutes, you're welcome to leave after the demonstration, or if you want to make and create afterwards, it's all mics off and we have a good old chat and answer your questions for the next 45 minutes. The sessions are an hour and a half long. I'm running an early bird discount at the moment, so if you're interested in that, if you want to comment under the video Zoom flower class, um, I will message you about claiming your early bird discount. Linda, you're so good. Glad to be embracing plastic free. <laughs> yeah, back in the day. It's like we had this new thing and it was all shiny and glittery, wasn't it? And we all wanted one. And then you're thinking, you know, even I was thinking I was washing up the other day and um, I noticed that when I watch lots of American YouTubers and they wash up, they don't have washing up bowls. So they're wasting lots of water. And I was thinking I have to run a washing up bowl full of water before my water's hot enough to use. I've been putting it on the garden because there's a water shortage. But I was thinking, how many washing up bowls have I gone through in my married life? There must be hundreds, well, perhaps not hundreds, but tens of them, you know, Perhaps, perhaps only 10, but where have those washing up bowls gone? That plastic, and it's so convenient for us, but we forget that that plastic's got to go somewhere at the end of its life. And of course, things can be shredded and reused, but it's just, you know, just try and use a little bit less, try and reuse things, and you know, don't go and buy, go out and buy all the latest bits and pieces. So I've got my cut down milk jug, which I'm using as my bucket to, to go around the garden. So before I start, I'm going to put some water into my basin there. So the, I would say 100% of the time your flowers have died, it's probably because you forgot to top it up with water. So especially when the weather is hot, you'll find that not only are the flowers taking up water, but also it's evaporating as well. So you need to be pushing your finger over the edge of your vase. And if you're having to go right the way down to the bottom to find the water, it's time to fill up um, a little bit more and as I've got a really small container this time around I'm probably going to have to check on that possibly you know twice a day um, you know mid-morning and then again early evening yes Linda plastic daffodils given away with um, washing powder again it was the neatest thing and think about um, you know the children's comics have always got some bit of plastic tat sellotape to the front and what happens to it you know it's just we, need, we just need to think a little bit. I think we just need to get used to not having everything immediately and to just sort of tempering our expectations, that consumerism, and especially with the cost. <laughs> You're saying you had your vase full. Um, you know, the cost of living crisis coming up. Um, you know, it's just being, looking after the pennies as well, looking after the pennies, looking after the environment. And that's the other good thing about Zoom flower class. Um, we're going to be concentrating on flower arranging techniques, so learning some new techniques. And you could do the whole class without actually using any flowers. Flowers are optional. But I'm going to be showing you techniques that you could incorporate into your full scale, school, full scale flower arrangements um, or just use as standalone, quite modern looks. So it just means that once you sign up for class, <coughs> excuse me, that you don't then need to set aside you know, 15 to 20 pounds a week to bring flowers. You will hardly need any flowers at all. And I've just seen a lovely long question at the top. And while I was talking, it's disappeared. I really do need someone else reading out these questions for me on the side. So anyway, that tipped out of my container, quite possibly between, of course, there's a breeze, but that was probably another quite good way to talk about balance, that my stem was too long and it was just tipping out the vase. And that's when the art of flower arranging becomes a little bit about physics and fulcrums and pivots and, and balance and things like that. So because I know I want it short later, I'm going to cut the stem off and I'm just going to cut it down to a more, to a more manageable size so it doesn't fall out of my container. And now over here, I have got my zinnias, which have been absolutely fantastic this year. So instead of picking, you know, the fabulous huge stems, I mean, that's as big as the palm of my hand, I'm going to go through and just pick the stems that are small, that are going to fit in with the scale of my Japanese anemone. And this is the thing I like as well. I'm not doing a mad supermarket dash. I'm not going in, I'll have one of those, one of those, one of those, and coming home. I'm thinking quite carefully, although I don't quite know what flowers I'm going to cut. It just then, the whole flower arranging thing becomes a more mindful, a more purposeful activity. I'm slowing everything down. and. Um, some of you may remember that 
a few years ago, probably three, if not four years ago, I ran um, a class on Facebook called Mindful Spring Flower Arrangement, Flower Arranging. And I ran that with a friend who was a mindfulness practitioner. And she used to give us garden meditations to do. And then we would go around the garden and just cut exactly what we need. So for that arrangement in, in that, that previous course, it was even looking at what the curve was on a particular stem. And if you knew that your arrangement was going to be this shape, that you had to get the branches, cut this shape, instead of going cut, 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 I need to get all the foliage. It was just about picking exactly what you needed. So I can see straight away, there's a flower here. So I'm going to cut it as long as I can. I cut it down to the next leaf. You know, that's quite small. So that's going to go into my pot. I've also got, and I've still got some bud type flowers and I've got my quite small dahlias as well. So I might, as my husband has gone out for his dog walk and I don't think he'll catch us again. Let's see what is round the corner. So dahlias, dahlias. So shall I keep it all shades of pink as we start with pink? I've only got a choice of pink and yellow. So I've got a nice zinnia here, which is actually green. That'll be a nice one. I have got a little bit of fluff of fennel, a bronze fennel. I'll bring that up and show you in a minute. And then my dahlias. I think I'll come. Our dahlias are not the fancy variety. They are um, just a single stem. I'm trying to cut them without cutting the buds that are going to come up next and perhaps even just to cut a bud that's about to come out into flower. So everything is quite tiny. That is the fennel I was talking about. It's got a lovely scent. So I'll drop those into the bucket while I have a look and see what else we've got. We've also got some verbena banaris. I'm not the greatest in my names, but let's see whether we can find some of that. So again, I just need to have, you know, oops, one stem, two stems. This always reminds me of red valerian. So we can have a look at that later. And what I did come round here for was the Lobelia hot lips. Now this, I'm afraid to say, isn't my favourite in the garden. It's a type of Salvia. Did I say it was a salvia? Hot lips anyway. I don't think, actually, I don't think this one is hot lips. The one that's hot lips is the one that's white with the red lipstick on it. Here. That is hot lips with a dash of red lipstick there. So I shall put that in my bucket. The other thing I'm thinking about, we've got some hydrangeas. Now is it time to start cutting hydrangeas to, to have them dry? Now normally we have a couple of family birthdays in September and normally I save my hydrangea cutting until after those family birthdays because you want to have the flower mature enough so you can feel the seed head developing but I am discovering with our hot weather that a lot of my hydrangea heads have just turned to a brown mush and I'm wondering whether that these might be robust enough to hold up and be dried. So what I'll do, I'm going to take off the leaves because they're damaged and I could either put that into my little um, windowsill vase flower arrangement or I could try and dry it. Now <laughs> we don't have a very big hydrangea bush and I haven't really got any heads that are much bigger but I'll just see how this first one holds up before I take all of them off the bush, because I don't want to harvest them all, then discover that they go limp rather than drying with that you know, nice robust head. So I don't want to um, pick too early, is what I'm trying to say. And I've actually taken that last leaf off as well. I want all the water to go to the heads and not to be diverted um, from, from the flower head. And the other thing I'm going to cut, that was reasonably plentiful, is the sedum here. So this is a bronzy, 
colour sedum. I think I just flicked the camera with some water. So probably if I was doing a conventional arrangement, I would come right down, I would cut off a great big long length. But because I'm doing something quite small, I could, for instance, get away with, you know, perhaps just one floret of the um, of the of the sedum and keep it small like that. And then across, can you see the dried out of the um, sweet peas you know maybe i'll cut a few sweet pea tendrils and have those so i'm having an experiment with donna who is one of the ladies in my free facebook group flower star world she has said that i should leave these on the plant until the whole plant goes this brownish color and i guess the pods will burst open more easily so she said these are just i need to keep them a bit longer so um got that there as well so i have got quite a limited selection of flowers so we will have to see whether i can make anything in this arrangement now i'm just wondering whether you want to come a tiny bit closer i angle the camera down so you can see what i'm doing so what i'm going i'm going to do first is to move my rather unsightly bottle in fact they don't look really pretty don't they if you just picked a few random stems of the garden and put them in the jam jar they'd look perfectly pretty like that they don't need to be you know arranged with a capital a but just to keep them out of the way so you can see what i'm doing i'm going to lift them one by one out of the container so i'm going to start with my lovely japanese anemone which i'm now in trouble for because i was caught cutting it i will say in my defense there were at least half a dozen stems left there. So I'm going to put this as one stem. And the beauty of this is that these leaves, sort of coming out in this rosette shape, are going to lie on top of my chicken wire. And it'll start to cover up the chicken wire. And this is the thing, if you use flower foam, you spend half your time trying to cover up the flower foam. Whereas with the chicken wire, it's not so unsightly. And it just gives a sort of freer, more simpler style of arranging. So if I want that to sort of rest like that, I can move the dish across the edge. And I know that I need to cut my stem like this. We will have to see whether it sits neatly or whether... Because there's more above than there is below, whether it's actually going to stand firmly and is it going to rock and roll? It's going to rock and roll, I think. So I'm going to put it slightly further back. So you can imagine, couldn't you, if you were doing an arrangement on a pin holder with the, you know, it's like the metal um, hairbrush, you could, you know, put, um, put a bit of Japanese and enemy on there and job done. You wouldn't need to add anything else. So you can see that's wandering around a little bit. But I have got the nap, you know, the breeze is just catching it a little bit. It looks a tiny bit, it's quite mesmerising, like a little America around going around. Now, if I was using chicken wire that was the unplastic covered chicken wire, what I could do then is scrunch up the mesh a little bit and, and almost get it to grab around the stem of the flower and it would hold more steadily. So if you bear with me, I'm going to try and pretend that it isn't circling around a bit because once it's indoors on my mantelpiece, there's not going to be that breath of fresh air and it's going to stay where I put it. Now, the way I could get it to stay would be to find the hole that I put the um, flower stem down and purposely put another piece of plant material in there. So with the chicken wire, I've now got, you know, two stems coming out and therefore it has sort of locked that in place. Now I'm going to make that, I'm going to, it's too bulky, even though it's a tiny bit of stem, so I'm going to split it down even more. So I don't want it to look over, you know, un unbalanced. So that's, that is holding nice and securely like that and then from there I will start to build up so then I've got my lovely small hydrangea but you can see once I put it in with my other flowers it's going to I'm going to cut this really down low and so it's sort of physically weighted at the bottom of the container so I know roughly how long to cut it I'm going to get rid of that tape I've put it in my um, compost bucket if, if I'm complaining I can't find it later and I could have that running off the edge there this other little bit of sedum, I could have that just poking it sort of elongated there and just a little bit lower. And you just start to build up. It's almost like you're building up this little fairy garden. And then with my sweet pea stems, I'm going to get rid of the shaggy leaves. So I've got more of the designer element of the sweet peas and 
put those in. So they're quite heavy at the end. Again, it's a really small, lightweight piece of material. So I've kept the stem, I've kept the stem long because if you were to look inside the container, it's actually running right the way along here. And in that way, it's anchored down. So although my container is quite shallow, some of the materials I've put in sideways and it's just a good way of anchoring them in so they don't fall apart. So my next biggest flower is here. I'm thinking it's quite short, this dahlia. I might like it to sort of rise up a little bit, stand up a little bit proud of that. And then I'm going to take these out so I can see what I've got. I've got the dahlia bud. So I'm going to put the dahlia bud as next to the dahlia as if it's sort of talking to it. So again, I always recut the stem and then I'll slide that in there. And will it sit where I want it to sit? Nope, so I can slide it out and just put it on the edge there, just coming out a little bit more. So although my container is quite small, I can put things out towards the outer edges and it just makes the whole arrangement look a little bit bigger. The question I will need to think about is that, you know, this bit of naked space here and do I need to add something in to sort of bridge the gap? So I might want to perhaps use the, this is the fennel. It's got the most aniseedy um, scent to it. It's absolutely glorious. And you can see, I don't know if you can see, the little sharp, um, bright, yellowy green. That's the flower head starting to develop. So it may be with the colour of the stem, I could sort of lay that over the top and that will help sort of bridge that gap between that bronzy stem of the um, dahlia and then having the bronziness of the fennel coming out over the top. It just doesn't, it means it's not quite so, so alone really. You want to sort of find little friends for your flowers to talk to, like that. And then there is my beautiful little zinnia. But the thing is, the leaves on the side look really huge. It's almost like a little scarecrow standing up. So I'm going to have pinch those off. I'll pinch one off first. Do I need to go with both of them off? Not sure at the moment. So um, you know, I might keep them because I haven't got any, I haven't actually got any greenery in this, but I might just, you know, rely on that single leaf there as I push that in. So that leaf is um, tucking over the edge of the vase there, just giving a little bit of green there, and a good bit of, um, you know, you, you're reading the, the sweet pea pod there against that leaf and of course I'm making this from behind I can't really see what I'm doing so when I finally put it on my mantelpiece I will no doubt be doing some tweaking to get exactly how I want it to be so these you know really small there but the, the petals will unfurl in due course and may well you know your flowers will change some of them will start to die off some of them will open up and get bigger and that is the beauty of flower arranging that you never quite know what you're going to come downstairs to the next day and what needs you know a little trim here a little trim there just to um you know bring it back to life again see it's a constantly evolving work of art so what i'm doing there cutting the recutting the stem getting rid of the seed heads there the the bumps and lumps so that when i add this stem in it's the clean stem going into the water I'm going to put that down across there. Again, that's sort of acting as a little foil. I am being brave. <laughs> yes, it's always difficult arranging flowers when you can't actually see what you're doing. So now I've got a bit more in, I can add, you know, perhaps I go a little bit taller. This again, it's a really fine flower. Perhaps I can come a little bit taller. Now I've got a bit, you know, a, a mesh of things in my vase. I can start to be a little braver with my placement. So I might just flick that in there, get that leaf around there just to hold it at the front. So it's, you know, it's, if you, it's like a miniature um, fairy garden arrangement with hardly any flowers in it. And then my verbena. Is that verbena bonaerarius? I don't quite know what it is, but you gardeners will know what that is. So these are, you know, a purple fluff. And what I think I might do is perhaps, you know, I don't always know where it's going to go. So I sort of hold it up and say, well, you know, do I want it down the center here? 
to break up the mass of the sedum or do I want it to come up quite high? Now, the higher I come, the more vulnerable they will come to moving around, a bit like when I put that first bit of Japanese anemone in. So I think this time I feel that I've you know, gone as high as I can. I feel I need a, a little bit of, um, you know, a bit of a break here. I'm going to come a little bit shorter and I might even thread these through the sedums just to break up that comparative bulk and mass. Now if, when you view that from the side, can you see here? So my arrangement isn't just flat fronted. There are things that come out towards the front as well. So having got that one in, coming to the front a little bit, I might put this one to come out even further to the front. So it just means you're starting to get the depth of field. So the arrangement is quite sparse at the back because no one's going to see that. It's going to be against my wall. And then if I look down on it, I've got an anemone bud. And then the next line, I've got a dahlia, the big dahlia, the more, more buds, more anemone, the salvia, and then the uh, zinnia at the front. And then there's another line going through that's got the, the fancy um, salvia, the hydrangea, the sedum, and then the other, um, the other zinnia as well. And that's the way that you would make up your arrangement. And then you would just add in as much or as little as you wanted to. So when I get this in my living room, I might think actually, you know, I've got an obvious gap. Do I need to fill that out a bit? And what I'll do when I'm going out, you know, the rest of the day, when I'm padding out and putting my next washing up bowl full of water on the garden or whatever I'm doing, I'll think perhaps a little bit of rosemary just there. So I just need to snip a little bit of rosemary, take off all those little side leaves. And I normally just dump them in the flower bed and then I can just put it in there and I can be making this arrangement over the course of the next couple of days. I definitely feel that it needs something a little bit in here, but I'm not going to beat myself up about that. Um, I sort of want the same, I don't want another piece of hydrangea, but I want something to balance the visual weight and dominance of that hydrangea just in here. It may be that, um, you know, it just needs another dahlia. I'm looking around, another little dahlia. Just recess down a little bit. Shall we have a go and pinch a dahlia? Can I get a dahlia? There's just one here. Snip. So I'm going to cut it in short. So that's, you know, little finger length long. And I can just put it down there. Oh yes, that's what I needed. Can you see? Do you prefer it with or without? And that's how you do it. And you decide what pleases you, what looks good in your eye. And if you really want to improve your flower arranging, of course you can come to class with me. But I would say take photographs of what you do and don't feel you need to overstuff. So shall we count how many stems I've got in here? Two zinnias, two, two dahlias, four, one an enemy, five, two of those, seven, sedum, eight, hydrangea, nine, two salvias, eleven. So with eleven stems of flower in what is quite a small dish, you know, a hand-sized dish. I've made a really pretty, dainty arrangement. So, Linda, you're checking out the cost of enamel washing up bowls. And the only thing about enamel, which is probably why plastic was loved so much, can you imagine if you're, um, you know, I don't do a lot of hand washing because we've got a dishwasher, but I do hand wash my glasses up and my special vintage plates and crockery. So um, it's just that, um, it's the clinking, isn't it, and the breakage. But... I guess what you could, it's about a thinking round, isn't it? It may be that you've got um, one washing up cloth that you line your enamel washing up bowl with, then do your washing up with your other cloth. So you've just got a little bit of protection. So it's just thinking outside the box really and going back to the ways of yesteryear and just reinventing them for today. Well, it's been so lovely talking to you today and I'm so pleased my Wi-Fi has stretched down to this particular part of the garden. I thought you might be getting a bit fed up with the view from my patio. What I'll do is I will take a photograph of this and I will post it on the community tab page for my YouTube channel and I'll also put a picture in my free Facebook group so if you're not already a member if you click underneath the video the little down arrow next to the video you'll find a lot of description blurbs or clickable links I'll leave a link there and if that's all too complicated for you if you just comment Facebook group I will um, I will 
I will re-comment with a link to the, the group, but you could always search Flower Start World. Flower Start is one word, world, in Facebook, and it'll take you to the group. So that's all for me for now, and I will see you again next Tuesday, um, and it'll be the normal time at 8.15, and then it's all back to school. So um, the changing seasons, time doesn't stand still. School starts, Halloween, bonfire night, and then it'll be all things Christmas. And don't forget, if you're interested in my Zoom flower class, there is um, um, an early bird discount at the moment. If you're on my mailing list, I'll be telling you more about that on Thursday. But if you are interested in class, wherever you see me mention Zoom flower class, if you comment Zoom or Zoom flower class, I will message you and just send you a few more details. That's all for me for now. And I'll see you again next Tuesday. And if you are in the Facebook group, I know me there for a cup of tea and a chat at noon on Friday. So I'll see you on Friday, if not. Tuesday. Bye.